Okay, here we go. We're going to start through the CPS process. Um, some of our responsibilities, which are mandated by the legislator, are to conduct civil investigations of reported child abuse and neglect, protect children from abuse and neglect, promote the safety, integrity, and stability of families, provide permanent placements for children who cannot safely remain in their home. And we conduct the investigations through our investigative units. Um, also, the Department of Family and Protective Services houses child care licensing, and so they also conduct investigations if a daycare center is involved or a licensed foster home. Um, we are charged with um, having prevention services available. Um, some of that is through the STAR program, through Baptist Children and Family Services, um, and through the services out in the community, you guys, we make referrals to community service providers, therapists, um, in all stages of service, whether it's investigations, family-based safety services, or conservatorship. Um, we are always trying to uh, use community resources to help the family stabilize and reduce the risk of abuse and neglect. And for children who cannot remain in their homes, um, we provide them placement and alternative placements, whether that's relatives, uh, with relatives or in foster homes. And we do license foster homes. Our agency is a child placing agency, as well as all of the private agencies around town, including Pathways, the Children's Shelter, Baptist Children and Family Services, um, the Bear Foundation, uh, just to name a few. Um, but all of those agencies also license the foster homes that our children are placed in. What is abuse and neglect? Um, this is kind of the short definition, but child abuse is an act or omission that endangers or impairs a child's physical, mental, or emotional health and development. I think it's important to note that not only does the law hold the perpetrator responsible, but also anyone else who knows of the abuse or neglect and fails to protect the children from those occurrences. So if a person or a parent <coughs> someone who's living in the home with that child is aware of a situation that's going on and fails to remove the child from that situation, they can also be validated as a perpetrator of abuse and neglect. And um, I think that's just important to note that it's not always the person who's committing the act, but also those who are residing with the child who could have done something to remove them from that situation. Here's a diagram with the stages of service um, in CPS. And kind of that arrow at the bottom has a continuum as to whether or not the parent has custody of the child or the state does. Um, all of our cases begin with an intake. Um, we don't go knocking on doors, asking if children and homes are safe. Um, community, uh, people in the community make a referral um, to our statewide intake hotline and that's how a case begins. Um, we do, uh, in this state, have a statewide hotline, which I'll give you in a little bit. Um, some states are county-based systems, but fortunately for us, we have a main office in Austin, and that's where statewide intake is located. Um, once that happens, um, it goes to an investigative stage, and those usually last 30 to 45 days, so that's a very short stage and a short involvement with the family. And at that time, the parent does still have custody of their child. Um, and then at that time, the case could be moved on to family-based safety services, which is a voluntary program. It's a, it's a chance for the department to offer services in home to the family to hopefully prevent the removal of that child. So if it is determined that there's risk in the home, um, we can work with them that way. And at that time, the parent does still have custody of the child. Sometimes in that stage of service, the family is asked to find a alternative placement for the child, a voluntary placement, um, if it's not determined safe in their current home. So they might go live with their aunt for 30 days while the investigation is being completed um, if it's determined that the child is, is in danger that way. Um, but the parent does remain the custodial, the legal guardian of the child. Um, and that, those cases usually last about six months. They do range. Some of them are shorter. Some of them are longer. And then conservatorship is the stage of service if the child has been legally removed from, from the parents. Um, if we're working with the family and the court is overseeing what's going on and the state has legal custody of the child. So that would be called conservatorship. 
And at that time, the agency has custody of the child. The parent no longer does. Even if the child is placed with a relative, the child is still in the custody of the state in a conservatorship stage. Just a little brief overview about reporting abuse and neglect. Um, there's two ways to report. Um, you can call our hotline toll-free 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, from anywhere you are, but it's only to report for te the state of Texas. Um, that number is 1-800-252-5400, and there will be somebody there to take your call around the clock. Sometimes you have to wait when you call on hold for 15 or 20 minutes. Um, it's not because your call is not important. There's just that many calls um, coming in at one time. So uh, be patient. Um, someone will be with you as soon as possible. If you don't want to wait on hold on the telephone, um, you can make your report online at www.txabusehotline.org. And there, if you are, sorry, in a role that um, you kind of have to make reports often, you can make an account where your, your kind of basic information is already in there, you have your own password, and um, you can make your report online. Um, I think it's important to know that if you'd like to make an anonymous an anonymous report that you need to call the hotline because if you do it on the web you're going to get confirmation via your email and they are going to ask for your name so you will have to report your name if you make a, a report uh, via the web and also if you feel that a child is in imminent danger and that it needs to be received by our agency sooner rather than later you need to call the hotline because it takes about 24 hours for a web report to, to go through the system and be assigned out for an investigation. So if you feel that a child is at great risk, then um, go ahead and call the hotline. But also remember that we're not a first responder agency. Um, even with a priority one report, um, the agency has 24 hours to make contact with that child. So if it is a dire emergency, you still need to call 911. Like, we don't, we don't go out immediately the way the police would to a situation. There is protection for reporters. Um, the identity of a reporter is kept confidential. Anonymous reports are accepted but can limit the scope of an investigation, um, especially if you're a professional in the community or a teacher or uh, someone who has very uh, information that's important to an investigation, we really ask that you do give your name. It's not given out to the family um, that's being investigated. It does help to, it helps the department to make the best decisions for the families that we're working with to have the most information. So we would always appreciate when a name is given. And reporters who act in good faith and without malice have immunity against civil and criminal liability. So, you, so it's okay to report just on a reasonable suspicion because you can't be held legally responsible if, if the allegations turn out to be false, as long as the report was made in good faith. <clears throat> you may feel like someone else will report it, but statistically only one-third of people who suspect that abuse and neglect is occurring actually take the time to make a report. Um, even though the Texas Family Code mandates that anyone who suspects um, should or must report. And it's also important to note that there's an extra layer of that for professionals, that the law requires that professionals make a report of child abuse and neglect within 48 hours of suspecting that the abuse or neglect has occurred. So not only is the community mandated to make a report if they suspect, but professionals are kind of held to even a higher standard. And it's also important to note that you, as a professional, you cannot delegate the task of reporting the abuse to somebody else. So if the child outcries to you, or you are the person who has the, the suspicion that the abuse or neglect is occurring, you're, you are the one who's required to make that report. The intake, which is kind of what we've been talking about. When you call to statewide intake, um, the person who is taking your report, their goal is to document and route the suspected cases of abuse and neglect that meet the statutory guidelines to local units for investigation. Uh, CPS gets, a, gets approximately a quarter of a million reports of abuse or neglect each year in the state of Texas. So, and of that, 66,000 of those, of those 
reports are confirmed victims of abuse and neglect. Here's just a graph showing the source of our reporters. Um, you'll note that school professionals are our highest at 19%. Um, we receive most of our referrals from school personnel um, with medical personnel following close behind. But you can take a look at, to see the breakdown. And we also could get, like I said, the same report or the same allegations or incident from multiple sources at one time. And sometimes that can be really important too because different people have different pieces of the puzzle that, and every little bit of information is important. You know, when those investigators and the caseworkers are out there making their decisions um, for these families. So it's important to remember that and always important to remember that you might have that one missing piece of information that, you know, we were needing in order to maybe be able to validate that abuse and neglect is occurring to get, a, get the family help and, and end a child's suffering. So again, I just encourage anytime you have a reasonable suspicion to go ahead and make that report. Just some tips on responding to abuse. If a child does make an outcry to you, I think it's important to remember to remain calm because they react to our reaction. So if they start talking, you know, and maybe we make a face or they might feel like they're doing something wrong when they're not. So just important to remain calm. Um, don't have any preconceived assumptions about the situation. Um, listen, document what you hear. Um, try not to cut the child's disclosure sh short. Just kind of let them talk freely until you feel like they've told you everything that they want to, to tell you about what's going on. Um, don't promise to keep a secret because by law we're all required to make that report to our hotline. Um, do not promise protection that you cannot deliver, um, mainly that maybe the child wouldn't have to go home that day because like I said, we're not a first responder agency. So in all likelihood, after a child does make an outcry, they do probably have to return to their current situation. Um, do not talk bad about the perpetrator. Um, and again, report any reasonable suspicion. Um, some issues that are challenging families in our community are poverty, limiting par limited parenting knowledge, uh, mental health issues, substance abuse, and family violence. And I think it's important to note that the mental health issues are not just with the adults in the home, but also with the children in the home. So it, it could be that the child is having, you know, behavioral health issues or mental health issues, or it could be the parent, or it could be a combination of both. I think that's a, a huge issue in our community and any community. Um, and so I think that's important to note. Um, substance abuse also is a, is a huge issue. I think the big three that we see recurring themes in our cases are mental health, substance abuse, and family violence. So those severely affect the home environment of the children. Eight types of abuse and neglect that we investigate. Um, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, and physical abuse. And then neglect is physical neglect, medical neglect, neglectful supervision, abandonment, and refusal to accept parental responsibility. And the majority of our cases are neglect cases. That's what we oftentimes see. And there's oftentimes chronic neglect going on in the homes of these kiddos here in our community. Um, the next few slides are, um, as you can see, these are all included in your packet, and they're the legal definitions of all the different types of abuse and neglect, and they're very wordy. Um, I don't think that I might not reread you the definitions, but we can definitely talk about um, the different types and maybe some signs to look for and that type of thing. Um, all of the legal definitions are found in the Texas Family Code in Chapter 261. Um, those are the laws that kind of govern our agency. There's also some federal laws and a few laws from different places, but if you're looking for the definitions of abuse and neglect, um, those statutory guidelines that our investigators have to go by to either validate people for abuse and neglect or rule them out, then those can be found in the Texas Family Code. And the first one here is emotional abuse. And the important thing about I think emotional abuse is if you're calling in an intake or a referral or you feel like that's going on, 
it's just very important to note how the situation is impacting the child's emotional, mental, or physical health um, because emotional abuse is extremely hard to validate um, because there might not be physical bruises or there might not be a home environment that you know you can go into and say this is definitely bad because there's a broken window that the child cut, sliced their hand open on. Um, and so emotional abuse is, is very hard to, to validate. And so if you are feeling like that's the situation that's going on or concerned about that, it's just very important to note how the actual acts that the child or that the parent is, is doing is directly impairing the child's emotional health or their mental health. Sexual abuse can be conduct that's harmful to the child, um, a failure to make reasonable efforts to prevent sexual conduct from happening to a child. Um, it could be that you know that the situation is going on and you're compelling the child to engage in the sexual conduct. Um, it could be that, you're, that a parent is exposing the child to pornographic or obscene materials. And as you can see, it also references the penal code in these legal definitions. And so that's also part of the statutory guidelines is the definitions that are also included in the penal code. Um, sexual abuse is also causing, permitting, encouraging, engaging in, or allowing sexual performance by a child. Some signs that sexual abuse is occurring a lot of times, unless you're a medical professional, you, you might not see a lot of these because it could be physical signs of sexually transmitted diseases, um, evidence of injury to the genital area, um, pregnancy in a young girl, um, difficulty sitting or walking could be signs that some sexual abuse is going on, um, an extreme fear of being alone with adults of a certain sex, um, sexual comments, behavior, or play, um, knowledge of sexual relations beyond what is expected for a child's age, um, and then sexual victimization of other children. These are all signs that the child could have possibly been sexually abused. Oftentimes, unless the child makes a direct outcry of sexual abuse, um, you know, we in the community won't necessarily know that it's going on. Um, in our sexual abuse investigations, we oftentimes work, actually all times, work hand in hand with Child Safe. And that's a great facility here in town. I don't know if any of y'all are from there, but um, it allows the child to be interviewed one time for it to be recorded there for law enforcement to, to watch the interview. And it helps the child to not have to tell their story over and over again about what happened. I think another important thing to note about sexual abuse cases is if you are the person that the child outcries to, you're what's known as an outcry witness. And even though this is kind of scary, um, your testimony in court can be let in without being objected to as hearsay because you were the outcry witness. And so, if, and that only pertains to the very first person that the child disclosed the information to. Physical abuse, that's oftentimes what most people think of when you say child abuse is physical abuse, the actual bruises or broken bones. Um, and physical abuse is a physical injury that results in substantial harm to the child or a genuine threat of substantial harm from physical injury to the child. Failure to prevent, or failure to make a reasonable effort to prevent an action by another person that results in a physical injury that results in substantial harm to the child. Um, the current use by a person of a controlled substance as defined by Chapter 41 of the Health and Safety Code in a manner or extent that the use results in physical, mental, or emotional injury to a child. Some other signs to look for um, that could be signs of physical abuse. Um, frequent injuries such as bruises, cuts, uh, black eyes, or burns without adequate explanation. Um, frequent complaints of pain without obvious injury because again we're looking for if there's an internal injury um, if the child's constantly complaining of pain. Burns or bruises in unusual patterns that may indicate the use of an instrument, a human bite, cigarette burns on any part of the body and by that sometimes um, there might be the shape of an iron. Um, 
or a belt buckle might be something that you'd seen or that you could tell that an instrument was used to burn, make the burn. Um, if a child has aggressive, disruptive, or destructive behavior, that could be a possible sign, or passive, withdrawn, or emotionless behavior, fear of going home to see the parent, um, injuries that appear after a child has not been seen for several days, and also if a child is continuously wearing unreasonable clothing for the season, like if they're constantly in jeans and a long shirt in July here in San Antonio, that might be a cause for concern because they might be hiding injuries that are on their body. Physical neglect is one of the forms of neglect that we investigate, and this is simply the failure to provide a child with food, clothing, or shelter necessary to sustain the life or health of the child, and that's um, excluding failure caused primarily by financial inability, unless relief services have been offered to the family and continually refused. Um, then it becomes a concern because there's help for them out there and they continue to allow the electricity to be off or continue to you know, live in inadequate conditions for the child. Um, some things that might be concerning to us is broken glass, nails, holes in the floor, if the home is, is filthy, um, chemicals are within reach of the children, if there's drugs that are within reach of the child, weapons that the child has access to, um, gang activity, prostitution, or selling drugs out of the home. And then kind of if there's a difference between wet filth versus dry filth, if it's moldy everywhere, um, if there's piles of garbage or wet laundry that have maybe mildewed in the home, um, if there's human or animal feces in the home environment, that would be extremely concerning. Um, uh, roach infestation, uh, rodents, scabies, um, if there is not adequate plumbing in the home, uh, electricity, and again, it's not, we understand that poverty is challenging a lot of families out there, and some of these things can be related to poverty and would not be validated for abuse or neglect, but again, if relief services have been offered to the family and, and still the situation continues on and it's affecting the child's well-being, then that would be when the department would become involved. Medical neglect, um, failing to seek, obtain, or follow through with medical care for the child, um, with the failure resulting in or presenting a substantial risk of death, disfigurement, or bodily injury, um, or if the failure results in an observable or material impairment to the growth development or functioning of the child. So it has to meet those guidelines. It can't just be the parent didn't take the, doc the child to the doctor one time when they had the flu. That's not the, the kind of thing that we're talking about as medical neglect, but it's, it's something that the child is, or that the parent is not following through on that can severely impair the child in the future or it could result in, in death. Neglectful supervision, um, I, I feel like this definition is, is important to know and neglectful supervision is where a lot of our cases fall under or, or the parents are validated for neglectful supervision. Um, placing the child in or failing to remove a child from a situation that a reasonable person could realize requires judgment or actions beyond the child's level of maturity, physical condition, or mental abilities, and that results in bodily injury or a substantial risk of immediate harm to the child. And it could also be placing the child in or failing to remove the child from a situation which the child would be exposed to substantial risk of sexual conduct harmful to the child. Um, some signs of neglectful supervision or just neglect in general might be obvious malnourishment, lack of personal cleanliness, uh, consistently torn or dirty clothing, if the child is stealing or begging for food, um, the child is unattended for long periods of time. Um, there could also be frequent tardiness or absence from school um, that could lend itself to bringing concern that something else is going on in the home, that the child is frequently late to school every single morning.